What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. I've been doing the title question for about a week now, so I think I have a big enough sample size. It's fairly evenly split, with slightly more people saying they'd prefer the Mega Mix title, so we will be sticking with that for now. I did see some confusion. The Mega Mixes on the weekdays are all new stories, as well as I can keep track of at least. Please remember that I do read about 2,000 stories a year, so I'm not going to be able to keep track of all of them all the time. There will be some repeats every now and again, although I do my best to make sure that doesn't happen. There were also some people complaining about the amount of ads in recent videos. I don't really know what to tell you guys about that. I've not really changed the frequencies of my ads at all in the entire time I've been doing YouTube, so I'm not really sure what's going on there. With all that being said, if you guys end up enjoying this video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. Doing any of those helps the video to do well and the channel to do well and ensures I can keep making these videos for a long time to come. If you guys have any thoughts about the stories in the video, please be sure to leave them in the comments below, as reading your guys' comments is one of my favorite parts about doing these videos, even if I don't respond to them often since I'm so busy. Last but not least, if you'd like to support the channel further than you already do, there should be a join button somewhere around the subscribe button. It's only $2 a month at the lowest tier, and you get special emoticons to use when you comment, and a special symbol next to your name. No content is locked behind the paywall, it's simply something you can do if you'd like to support the channel further than you already do. Without further ado, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll get right into the video. This story happened to me a while back when I still lived at my parents' home. I was commuting to college at the time and had three siblings that also lived there with me, a brother and two sisters. For some context, we lived on five acres in rural Ohio, surrounded on both sides by woods and farm fields. Additionally, during the week, my dad normally left for work at 2 a.m. I had always felt like it was my job to be the man of the house because he was gone during the times when you would imagine something sketchy happening. On this night, because it was the weekend, my dad was home, however. In the middle of the night, I was woken up to the sound of my brother's voice trying to grab my attention. We had separate rooms upstairs, and coming out of our rooms, you could look down over the banister and see all the way to our front door. When I woke up, it took a few moments to get out of the haze and realize what was going on. I looked at the clock and noticed it was around 2.30 a.m. or so. My brother told me there were two men at our front door. This really woke me up. We quietly walked out of my room and peeked over to look down at the area. When we looked, there was no one at the door, but I did notice my parents off to the side just out of view of the class on the front door. I whispered down to my dad to ask what was happening. He told me there were two men who had been standing there talking to each other in front of our door and knocking continuously. Hearing my dad say this freaked me out even more. I went back to my room and grabbed my pistol, quickly shuffling down the stairs after looking to make sure they weren't at the door once more. If they had been, they would have easily seen me coming down the stairs, as it was in direct view. My brother was right behind me, as we headed over to where my parents were, whispering to try and find out what was going on. Apparently, my parents had awoken to the sound of our dog barking and come out to find these two strange men knocking loudly at the door over and over. At this point, the men returned and began to knock again, despite the fact that no one had come to the door and our dog was still actively barking. The fact that they were here at this time, in a location where houses were spread out over hundreds of yards and still knocking, made the situation even more terrifying. After a couple of minutes of knocking, the men walked away. We all shuffled across the kitchen into the family room to peek out the windows into our driveway. We could see there was a black Cadillac just sitting there, but no one was inside from what we could see, and no one seemed to be in the immediate area either. Immediately, the question was, well, where did those guys go then? They weren't in their car, and they were no longer at the front door either. 
Unfortunately, we figured out the answer when the handles on our back French door started to jiggle wildly. They were actively trying to enter the back of our home, which entered directly into the kitchen. At this point, I remember my mom frantically calling my dad's name as pure terror overwhelmed her. Then, two things happened. Adrenaline filled my body as I prepared my handgun, horrified at the very real possibility I may have to shoot someone tonight. And secondly, my dad grabbed the phone, called the police, and very calmly told them what was happening. After a minute of jiggling, they stopped with the back door and disappeared once again, only to return to knocking at the front door later. At this point, several minutes had gone by. Suddenly, we saw the local police fly up in multiple cruisers, all with their lights on. As they whipped into our driveway and front yard, the two men bolted away, attempting to run the long way around the house across the driveway. One of them disappeared out of our view, but the other one was intercepted by an officer, now yelling at him to get on the ground. He didn't and tried to run still, and was immediately tased. He fell flat on his face. Some of the officers went around the house, after the other man. One of them came to talk to my dad, and I came out the front as well. They actually ended up finding the other guy hiding in my sister's playhouse in the backyard. It appears both of them were drunk or high or something, as the one who hid had cocaine on him. They were both arrested that night, but we did never figure out what they were charged with, or what happened with them. We weren't sure why they were there either. Needless to say, though, the whole experience was not fun. I must have told this story over a hundred times, and despite being the most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me, I've come to appreciate that it makes for a great story. I figured because of this, I'd share it with you all. I should start by saying that I always hated going camping, my parents sent me to summer camp every year in Colorado, which involved at least one camping trip into the woods. Despite the brevity of these trips, I always resented them. The heavy bag, the lack of toilets, the spiders that always found their way into my tent. When I turned 16 and became a camp counselor in training, however, my distaste for the whole experience briefly changed. At that age, we were only a few years older than the oldest campers but we were given considerable leeway in what we were allowed to do. Most nights we would have to stay in the cabin with our campers, but it was rumored that the camping trip was a time where the counselors in training would get drunk, smoke weed, and hook up with each other after everyone else went to sleep. What I did not know at the time, however, was that the events of this camping trip would dissuade me from ever going camping again. The trip began as any other might, Altogether, there were 30 people on the trip. Four counselors in training, four real counselors, and around 20 or so boys and girls between the ages of 13 and 14, walking in a single file line up and down various trails. You could barely hear the sounds of nature over the conversations and laughter of the campers. Several hours went by, and we made our way through a dense marshy area and up a steep incline populated with evergreens and aspens. I was not the most athletic person, so it was at around this point that I found myself stumbling to the back of the line with one of the other counselors in training, Jordan, as well as two other campers who were really struggling to keep up. The four of us started chatting, and in our distracted state, we began to fall more and more behind the rest of the campers. Eventually, the last of them faded out of view, around a bend about 50 feet up the way. Unconcerned, we kept walking at the same slow pace, but after 30 minutes or so, the trail started to level off, and I began to feel increasingly anxious. Not only had the rest of the group completely disappeared ahead of us, but we had entered a stretch of completely dead evergreens, half of which looked scorched by a wildfire, and the other half, which appeared to have been killed by a disease of some sort. The eeriness of this landscape was punctuated by a small derelict cabin sitting in the middle of this scorched forest. It was seemingly untouched by the fire that had spread through the area. We were so enraptured by this scene that one of the campers screamed when a twig broke behind us. Jordan and I started laughing a bit, but we quickly stopped when we turned around to look at where the sound had come from. Not 20 feet behind us, 
There was a haggard looking man with a messy nest of black hair and a big thick beard. He was slowly making his way up the trail with his eyes locked to us. He didn't appear to have any supplies on him and we had no idea how long he'd been walking behind us. Being young, we were naturally freaked out. Jordan managed to give the guy a wave before saying to the rest of us, Come on, let's go and get back with the rest of the group. As we turned to continue our way up the path, the man mumbled a question that was hard to hear. I was shocked when Jordan turned around to ask the man to repeat himself. Going camping? Jordan answered the man. Yeah, we're going with a group. The man smiled before stating in a creepy and ominous voice, Well, you better be careful. We nodded and gave a half-hearted thank you before continuing on to try and find the rest of the group, this time at a much faster pace. Although the man had been walking up the same trail as us when we saw him, he didn't continue. He stood there in the center, watching us as we made our way up the winding path and eventually disappeared from his view. Finally, we managed to catch up with the rest of the group. They had all been waiting up ahead for us. We told the adult counselors about our interaction with the man. They just shrugged it off, telling us the guy probably lived in that cabin and wanted to know what we were doing on his property. Still, I felt unnerved by the encounter, and when we finally arrived at the campsite, I couldn't shake the feeling that the man had somehow followed us. Eventually, I did put it out of my mind and managed to start enjoying myself a bit. Everyone else had gone to bed at some point, and Jordan and the other counselors in training from the boys' cabin brought two warm Mike's Harders that they had stolen from the counselors' quarters. I took out a joint I had stashed away for this exact occasion. To avoid getting into trouble, we hiked out into the woods to smoke the joint together. We made our way to the edge of the river, where we washed our pots and pans earlier in the day. The spot was eerily silent, and suddenly the thought of the man from earlier popped into my head. I guess they assumed I was cold and not anxious because Jordan handed me his blue hoodie, and this prompted one of the other girls to suggest we switch tents for the night so I could sleep in the same tent with him and she could sleep in the same tent as the other boy. I had no problem with this really, and after smoking the joint we made our way back. The tents were pitched slightly away from the others, and we discreetly sipped on the mics harder as well telling scary camping stories. Some time passed by. One of the boys was in the middle of telling a rather confused story he was clearly making up on the spot when he suddenly stopped altogether. In the silence, we could hear what sounded like footsteps crunching on pine needles about 40 feet away. It was near one of the other camper's tents. As we strained to focus on what was going on, the noises stopped. We assumed it was just one of the campers getting up to go to the bathroom. Being stoned and hopped up from the scary stories, we decided to call it a night and go hide away in our tents. We awkwardly made it out of there before eventually going to sleep. I don't know what time it was, but it must have been quite late when I suddenly woke up to the distinct sounds of footsteps walking around my tent. Shot up with adrenaline, I tried to lay as still as possible and quiet my breathing down. From the noises, it was apparent someone was less than three feet away from the front of my tent seemingly pacing back and forth. I turned to wake up Jordan. I felt a bit more relieved when I saw he wasn't next to me. I was assuming Jordan must be the one I was hearing. I closed my eyes and just as I was beginning to drift back up to sleep, I heard the tent unzip. I felt Jordan lie down next to me and after a few moments he wrapped his arms around me and began to spoon me. I realized I had to go to the bathroom I muttered something about having to go before beginning to unzip my sleeping bag. Seemingly annoyed by the noise, Jordan lazily turned over, pulling his hoodie up over his head before going still again. Quietly, as to not wake him, I unzipped the tent and quickly scanned the campsite for any movement. Comforting myself that Jordan had just gone to pee and was fine, I put my shoes on and began making the trek across our campsite to the designated zone. I just made it to the area and pulled my pants down when I heard the rustling coming from the campsite. Someone was rummaging through our supplies and bags. Still slightly drunk, I pulled my pants up and in my haste, lost my balance. I tried to catch myself with a branch that snapped as I grabbed it. I tried to gather myself as quietly as I could, but when I managed to look up, I could see a figure in the darkness making its way across our campsite in my direction. 
Before I could even think, I was blinded by the bright light of a flashlight shining directly into my eyes. The light was getting bigger, so whoever this was was coming right toward me. Frozen and panicked, I watched as the figure came right in front of me. Before I heard Jordan's voice call out, Hey, sorry I scared you, it's just me. I breathed a sigh of relief. Then Jordan asked something that really confused me though. Hey, have you seen my blue hoodie anywhere? I know you gave it back to me, but I think one of the campers must have stolen it from my bag or something while I was sleeping. After a brief pause, I managed to stutter out. But you were just wearing it when you got back in the tent. What are you talking about? He said. It's been missing since we got back from the river. I even went down there to see if you had left it by accident. But after I couldn't find it, I went to check the boys' bags. And that's when I saw you. My confusion quickly turned to sheer terror as I realized the person who climbed into the tent with me just moments prior was not Jordan. Sensing that something was wrong, Jordan asked me what happened. I managed to choke out that whoever stole his item was sleeping in our tent. Not believing me, he insisted on walking back to check it out. As slowly and quietly as possible, we made our way to the side of the tent. When Jordan flipped on his flashlight and shined it in through the nylon lining, he let out a high-pitched scream. We could both see the clear outline of a man's shadow lying still inside our tent. What happened next is a bit of a blur. We ran to the pot of tents on the other side of the campground where the older counselors were sleeping. We frantically unzipped their tent and started screaming for help. There was a man in our tent. I remember panic setting in as our counselors slowly and groggily woke up. After a bit of frantic yelling, they managed to understand the severity of the situation. A commotion broke out on the other side of camp near our tent. By the time they ran to the scene, however, they only found an unzipped tent and a bunch of our things littered on the ground. The man had apparently knocked them over or thrown them out during his escape. We heard the counselors radioing back down to the camp to call the police, and we could tell them they were just as scared as we were. I don't think any of us got sleep after that. Luckily, we only had to wait a few hours for the sun to come up and by that time a few other people had arrived with guns to escort us back to camp. On our way back down, one of the campers found Jordan's jacket tied around one of the trees on the path, like some kind of marker. Needless to say, he didn't want it back, and we just left it there. To this day, I can't say for certain that the man in the tent was the same guy we ran into earlier on the trail, but his face and that night still haunt me. When my dad passed away, one of the many things he left me was his cabin. I hadn't been to it since I was a little kid. Being out in the wilderness was never really my thing. Although it had electricity and even one of those big old satellite dishes, I still always felt it was too far away from civilization to truly enjoy it. It meant a whole lot to my father though, so when I inherited it, I decided not to sell it. I went up to it occasionally, just to maintain it and make sure it was safe and secure still. I never had any intentions of spending significant time there myself, though about five years after I took possession of the cabin, I had a really unpleasant experience when I went to do a routine check of the place. When I would do this, I generally drove up for the weekend. It was a very long drive from where I lived, so I would spend the entire weekend there, then head home. This particular time, the weather report proved to be extremely wrong on the way to the cabin. Dark green and black clouds began to overtake the entire sky while I was driving out into the hills. I had a front row seat to an amazing lightning show though. This was going to be one of those really nasty storms. I could tell the minute I arrived at the cabin. I couldn't figure out why, but I immediately had a feeling of nervousness wash over me. I was hoping this was just because of the storm, and not that I was getting a sixth sense about something. The rain began to fall about five minutes prior to my arrival. It was pouring down extremely hard by the time I left my car. I hadn't brought an umbrella with me and had to run to the door. I was distressed to realize the door was unlocked. I began to worry right away because of this. It had been about six months since the last time I had been there so I had no way of remembering if I had locked it or not. 
I was concerned someone may have robbed me in the meantime. I went inside and for the most part, everything looked pretty normal. That was until I went into the kitchen and I got really concerned. The window on the kitchen door was broken and had a garbage bag taped up over it. I certainly hadn't done that. Someone had broken in. I immediately went to the front door and locked it shut. If the person had been staying there though, they didn't seem to be here now. I checked throughout the cabin and made sure all the windows were locked. I would have gone back out to my car and went to the police if the rain weren't coming down as hard as it was. I went throughout the house and checked to see if anything was missing. The bedroom was a bit of a mess. I checked the closet though and thankfully my dad's shotgun was still right where I'd left it. I really had no experience with guns, but I did know how to load it. I did so and laid it down on the bed. If someone had been living there and was going to be coming back, I needed to be prepared for if they were dangerous. I had been in the cabin for a few hours before nightfall fell. I made sure the lights in the front room were on, so if whoever had been there came back, they would see that somebody was there now. It was really late at night when I saw a pair of headlights shine through the front window and onto the cabin wall. Peeking outside, I saw what I assumed to be a large truck with its high beams on. Two people got out of the cab, but didn't turn the lights off. I was already worried, but I was even more so when I noticed both of them looked to be carrying rifles with them. They stood in front of the truck for a moment before I saw them begin to walk forward. They stopped at my car and stood on either side. I watched as both of them raised the butt of their rifles and heard the sound of both of my car windows shattering. After that, they shattered the back windows as well, then began moving back toward the house. Of course, I panicked. I had two people who were obviously the ones who had broken into my father's cabin, approaching it after breaking the windows out of my car. I ran over and grabbed the shotgun. I wasn't sure what I could do because I wasn't going to open the door for them. That would expose myself right proper, but these guys were going to get up to the cabin door and who knew what they would do if they got a hold of me. I went and broke the window or the front door. I stuck the barrel of the shotgun out and pulled the trigger. In addition to the loud explosion, I heard one of the guys scream out and fall over. I was concerned I'd blasted him directly. I'd simply wanted to fire a warning shot. The other took his rifle and shot at the house a couple of times. I watched from a vantage point from which neither man could see me. I saw him help the other man to his feet and pull him back to the truck. He tossed the hurt guy into the cab and they drove off. I spent the rest of the night completely on edge, expecting them to return. The interior of my car was completely ruined. I had to clean it out to at least drive into town. I brought the sheriff out and let him look around. I ended up spending a few more days up there, restoring the damage done to my cabin. There wasn't a whole lot more I could do, other than install a security system. I try to go up to it every couple of months now instead of every six, and each time I do, it's scary as hell. Every time I open that door, I expect one of those guys to be back there. My first Christmas away at college was a sort of sordid, lonely affair. I didn't have the money to go home and spend Christmas with my family. My college did allow students to stay over in their dorm rooms during holiday break, though. This meant that I stayed in my room for the entire five weeks between the two semesters. Obviously, not a whole lot of other students did this. This meant that the huge, normally packed campus was basically turned into a winter wasteland. You know, I actually had a lot of problems during this break. I've actually shared a few of them before, but I haven't shared this one yet. First off, I was drinking quite a lot during this time. I didn't really think too much about it, though. I was in college, and it wasn't like it was hurting anyone, so I just did it. My personal drink of choice was vanilla vodka. I can't count how many days and nights I walked down to the store in order to grab some. On Christmas Eve, I was feeling particularly lonely, and I really didn't have much to drink on me. Not only that, I realized the liquor store would be closed on Christmas Day. 
To be honest, I was surprised that with so few students on campus that the store was even open on Christmas Eve as well. I decided to walk down to the store. Now, if any of you have ever been on a large campus or in a big city when it didn't have many people around, it's a very strange and surreal experience. It kind of makes you a little bit more wary of whatever or whomever you do happen to see. When I walked into the store, I noticed that there was someone leaning against the outside. I was horrified, thinking it must be a homeless man, especially because of just how cold it was outside. I mean, just the wind chill had to be below zero. I went into the store and bought my stuff. Then, when I came out, I observed the guy a bit more closely. The side of the store was an alleyway that he happened to be sitting in. I could tell he was breathing, so he was still alive, thankfully. I really wished I could do something to help him. I felt bad for buying the vodka when I didn't really have money to give, and I could have given him some. I decided to walk home, but it wasn't long before I turned around and looked back at the store. I was feeling a bit bad. I noticed that the guy on the side of the door had gotten up, though. Not only that, but he had begun walking in the direction that I was walking in. I started to get a little bit nervous, especially so when he crossed the street and was on the same side as me now. I began to wonder if he had done that on purpose, because now it was clear he was following me, and I couldn't really think of any good reason to do that. The walk back wasn't a short one either. As I kept on going, I looked back at the guy as he made it obvious he was following me. I didn't assume he was a student either, because he certainly did not look like one. He was batted in old and dirty clothes, which I had noticed when he was sitting against the store. He smelled quite bad, too. Anyway, he took every single turn that I took, even ones that didn't lead me directly back to my campus dorm. So, there was no doubt he was following me. Now, when we got closer to it, there was a small way I took to get there. I would cut behind this building, walking on earth rather than sidewalk. There were a lot of trees back there, so it was not the most ideal place to walk when someone was following you, but it would cut a few minutes off the travel time. When I got through there, I was in more of an open spot. There was also a light right above as I got back onto the sidewalk. I went to look back again, and at that point I saw the man once more. This time, though, I saw him standing in the light, or really the first time. He was walking a little bit arched over, theatrically swinging his arms back and forth. He seemed to be wearing a Santa hat, and I noticed it looked like he didn't have any hands. It looked like he had hooks instead. In a normal situation, I think that wouldn't bother me much. I mean, I even once worked with a disabled guy who had two hooks for hands because he thought it looked cool, but this situation was a bit different. This guy was obviously following me and was swinging those hooks back and forth in what looked like an aggressive manner. Not knowing what else to do, I took off running, and I ran as fast as I could. I didn't even worry I might slip on the ground because of the ice. I did almost fall forward a couple of times, but thankfully I managed to hold my footing. I sprinted all the way back to the dorm. Taking out my card to open the door, I fumbled with it and realized why people from horror movies might fumble with their cards so much. I did manage to get inside and quickly shut it behind me. Looking back, I noticed the man was still out there, but now he had stopped pursuing me. Instead, he was just kind of standing there, a bit far back from the entrance. He was just staring at me. I kept on watching him. Finally, he lifted one of his hooked hands, waved it at me like he was telling me goodbye, and then turned and slowly walked away. I never saw that hooked man again. I don't know if he was wanting to rob me or hurt me or if he was even just screwing with me because he thought it was funny. I mean, the situation was really out there. I could absolutely believe it was a man who happened to have two hooked hands that really wanted to mess with me. I don't know, but it was terrifying when it happened. I went back to my dorm room and had a whole lot of vanilla vodka to celebrate that Christmas Eve. Hello, you can call me Evie. I wanted to tell my story because it was absolutely terrifying at the time it happened. It all started on the morning of February 14th, 2018. 
I was in middle school at the time, and the campus was buzzing with life. Guys were running around with gifts for their girlfriends, girlfriends were handing out gifts to their boyfriends, and friends were exchanging candies. All in all, everything was fairly normal. Now, I wasn't popular per se, but I knew everyone and everyone sort of knew me. I preferred to hang around with a small group of close friends though, because being around too many people made me very anxious. During lunch, I was hanging around with my usual group of friends, which consisted of two girls, Alex and Mia, and three guys, Nico, Adrian, and Elijah. Valentine's Day of all days made me even more anxious. A lot of people would try to join our group because my friend Adrian attracted a lot of girls. My friend Mia was also very attractive and a sweetheart as well, so a lot of guys would come over for her. I began to feel a bit overwhelmed by all these people, so I slipped out of my group and headed to my secret hiding place. Really though, it was just a bench that was sort of out of the way in a field hidden by some trees. No one really went out there since it was so far so it was a good place to kind of recollect and catch my breath. As I was reading through a book I had, I could hear someone getting closer to me. I looked up to see this guy named Emmanuel. When I saw Emmanuel, I instantly started to freak out. He always seemed to have this sort of weird infatuation with me. Every day he would force himself on me, randomly touching me, trying to kiss me, yelling that he liked me in my face. Believe it or not, I would even see him wandering around my neighborhood, and he didn't live anywhere near there. I decided to play it cool and continue reading. All of a sudden, he just grabbed the book right out of my hands. Hey, what the hell, man? I was reading that, I yelled. He simply responded, Sorry, I just wanted your attention. I was still angry, but I tried to calm myself down. All right, well, what do you want? I really like you. I want you to be my girlfriend. I swear I'll treat you like a queen. After he said that, he handed me a box of chocolates and this stuffed bear. Actually, I thought it was quite a nice gesture. I always felt uncomfortable when he was around though, so I told him that even though it was very sweet of him, I was already in a relationship. That was of course not true. The instant the words left my mouth, he turned from being nice to extremely angry. He screamed at me, asking how dare I date someone that was not him. I tried to get up to leave, but he grabbed my arm and shoved me back down and forcefully kissed me, with tongue and all. It was gross. I tried to push him off of me, but he was way stronger than I was. I screamed for help at the top of my lungs, but he quickly covered over my mouth. I bit his hand and kicked him in the balls. He was shocked. I broke free and ran to my friend group. He yelled behind me, screaming out how he would rear me and kill me. Obviously, the on-duty guards heard this and immediately took action. I just wanted to get to the safety of my group though, so I kept running until I bumped into Adrian. I grabbed a hold of him and cried my eyes out. He comforted me until I was ready to talk to him. I told him everything that happened when I was called into the principal's office. They had me explain everything and the police were called right away. It was a really long day, and I just wanted to go home. After I told them what happened, I was allowed to leave for home early. I later found out that in his house, he had built a shrine for me, with pictures of me doing various things. Walking my dog, eating in the living room with my family, he'd even taken photos of me changing. It was horrible and traumatizing, so I hope I never have to meet him again. This happened about five or six years ago. I believe I was around 18 at the time. For starters, I lived in a city where neighborhoods and forests kind of blend together. There are plenty of wooded areas where people go to have bonfires and parties and that sorts of thing. One night, after discovering that all of our usual spots were already crowded with people, I suggested we go to a spot I had been to a few times nearby. I had in fact been there several times, but only ever during the day. The street where we parked was about 200 feet away from the tree line. It was your average middle class neighborhood. Nothing crazy was really known to happen there. 
So we walk over, start a bonfire, and we're all having a really good time. Some of us are drinking and smoking a bit, myself included. About 45 minutes passed by, and I was now a little bit intoxicated. Not anything major, though. Over the sound of our quiet music and my friends talking, I began to make out an odd sound. I couldn't quite tell what it was at first, so I wrote it off as just hearing things initially. After maybe another 10 minutes went by, though, I began to hear it again, a little bit louder this time. It still sounded relatively far away, but it sounded almost like Velcro tearing or something. I stopped and just kind of sat there, trying to listen to what was going on, while my friends were oblivious and carried away laughing and talking. They hadn't seemed to have noticed yet. That's when I heard it clearer, a sound I was very familiar with. A zapping noise, like the kind you'd hear from a taser. It was very brief, but unmistakable. My stomach dropped, and I began to look around a little frantically. My girlfriend at the time was the first to notice my distress. She asked me what was wrong, and I explained what just happened. She immediately started worrying as well. She got my friends to quiet down as best she could, and we all sat there in silence, listening out for any noise. Then we all heard it, an electric zap, brief again but we all recognized the sound. We started panicking a bit, we quickly put out the fire while asking each other what the fuck that was or where it was coming from. We were all too scared to walk out. It was only a five minute walk to the street, but it was through pitch black darkness. With all of us collectively, we mustered up the courage to finally walk the path out and we didn't run into anyone on our way there. We finally got to the street and began to walk towards our cars, nervously laughing and relishing in being under the street lamps once again. That was when we saw him. I saw him first, a man walking in the darkness towards us, not at us, just kind of walking in the direction we'd just come from, slightly to the right of us. He appeared to be holding some sort of stick of some sort. The man's appearance obviously scared me at first, but after a brief second I calmed myself down. It was a pretty safe neighborhood that I knew really well, and it was common to see people out walking at night. Then, though, I noticed he was staring right at us. His stare burned itself into my mind. We passed each other by. My friends and I were all silent, as we were having a stare down with this random man. Not even breaking eye contact, as soon as we passed him by, he held up the pole in his hands and smiled this huge, creepy smile. His eyes opened so wide they almost bulged out of his head. The end of the stick lit up a bright light, and that same zapping sound happened once again, much louder this time. The man was holding a cattle prod. We live in a city with no farmland nearby. There was no reason to have a thing like that on him. My friends and I were silently shishing ourselves as he began to follow behind us about 20 feet away. When we got to our cars, he ran into the woods without a flashlight or anything. We all hopped in and peeled the fuck out of there. We never went back to that spot again. Okay, so this happened to me when I was around 18 or 19 and just started college in a small town in the south. I had a pretty terrible college experience in general, but this just added to the sh show that was my first year. To set the scene, I lived in a suite building with a parking garage attached to it. There were probably four or five levels to this garage, and the top level was at ground level. The suite building was about a five-minute walk down a sidewalk to the entrance. There was also a little room with windows that housed the elevator nearby the sidewalk. My boyfriend at the time lived off campus, and I hated being on campus so much that I spent a lot of time at his house in a neighboring town. I did have an 8am class though, so I would usually at least go back to my suite at some point in the night or early morning if I could. One night, I'd just gotten back at around 2am, the parking garage was pretty full on this night, and I had to park at the furthest end of the building, closer to the ramp that went down to the lower levels. I'm terrified of being inside parking garages for long times, so usually I'd always park at the top. 
It was pretty dark out. I would also usually call my sister or my boyfriend if I was spooked. This night was pretty normal though, so I didn't really feel the need to bother them yet. I was almost to the sidewalk when I noticed someone in the little room where the elevator was. They had been hidden behind a wall, but after I passed them by, I saw them emerge. It seemed he'd come out as soon as he thought I wouldn't notice him, since I wasn't able to see him through the windows there. I didn't get a great look at him, but I could tell it was a middle-aged man. I found it quite odd such a person would be on campus so late at night, and in the building where there were mostly only young people and freshmen as well. I tried my best to just ignore this person and continue on my way. As I reached the nearby sidewalk though, about 20 feet away, I could see he was more brazenly following me now, walking right behind me. I tried my best to be rational and not freak out. The further I walked though, the more I realized he was now gaining on me. There was one of those posts nearby where you could hit a button for campus police, but something inside of me told me that I had to not let him know I knew he was there and that he was also scaring me. In a few seconds time, I had to make a decision. I started to sprint down the sidewalk. Right from behind me, I could hear him pick up speed and start running on the pavement as well. He was chasing me. There were three entrances to this building. Usually I used the furthest one because my room was on the far side of the building. As soon as I got to this first entrance though, I swiped my card as fast as possible, threw open the door, and slammed it shut behind me. The man was right there right on the other side of that door. He made eye contact with me for a while, then turned and sprinted the other way and out of view. I was so f***ing scared that night, and still to this day. I wonder what his intentions really were. Probably for the best I never had to find out. The very next morning, I woke up to an emergency email about a strange man that had been spotted on campus the previous night. Still gives me creeps whenever I think about it. A few years back, I rented a cabin with my friend Jennifer out in the forest. We were in the mood to spend some time out in nature, but we weren't willing to go all the way and spend time in tents. Because of this, she rented the cabin, and we were set to spend two weeks there. The cabin itself was set pretty far out into the woods. There were no other cabins that were really close by to it, we wanted the full experience and felt that being isolated was the best way to get this. There wasn't electricity, so there wasn't a TV or anything like that. There was a propane tank that gave us hot water and allowed us to use the stove. Other than that, it was pretty rustic. For the first week, we had the sort of experience we had been looking to get. We did some hiking, some fishing, saw all sorts of birds and other animals. We actually began to feel really relaxed being far away from any people. At the beginning of the second week though, we were inside preparing lunch when all of a sudden we heard a knock at the door. Needless to say, we were very surprised. It was the first contact we'd had with a single person since we'd gone. I went to check the door only to see there was a man standing there, possibly in his mid-thirties or so, waiting outside. I asked the man what he needed and he told me he was the landlord for the cabin. He was there to collect the rent for the week. This was puzzling, because not only had we never seen this guy before, we'd also paid for the cabin in full before we moved in. I told him this, of course, and he said he didn't know what we were talking about. He then told us that if we did not pay him for the week, he would have to call the police and remove us from the cabin forcibly. I got extremely angry at this point, and told him to go right ahead. We had the receipt showing we had paid for this cabin in full. The man began to get irate again, starting to yell at me, so I slammed the door right in his face. We watched from the window as the man went out to his jeep and drove away. I figured he must be some sort of con artist and tried to put it out of my mind. It seemed like a really stupid con though. That had been around noontime or so, and we hadn't seen or heard from that person again. We figured he'd realized we'd seen through his con, and thusly was not going to try again. 
Jennifer went to her room and went to bed early. I, though, decided to stay up and do some reading before bed. It was pretty late now. I heard Jennifer scream in the other room. Immediately, I dropped my book, shot up, and ran over to her door. I didn't even have to knock on it as she threw the door open and grabbed me. A noise woke me up, and that guy from earlier was looking in through my window, Jennifer told me frantically. I rushed into the bedroom and looked out, but the guy was not there any longer. Well, at first I thought so, but then I began to hear a pounding on the front door, a loud, frantic pounding. I ran into the living room and saw the man looking in through the window. He looked extremely pissed. Give me my damn money! He began shouting over and over again. I was happy that the door was locked. The man moved away, but just when I thought he had gone, I heard a crashing noise and a rock came flying through one of the living room windows. Glass shattered all over the place. The man then tried to come into the house through the window. He had gotten partway in and was trying to pull the curtains to the side. I was at a complete loss as to what to do. I didn't have a gun or anything like that, which at this point in time made me feel real bad about it. Jennifer, however, had her wits about her. She ran into the kitchen and grabbed a heavy skillet. By the time the intruder got the curtain out of his face, Jennifer slammed him right in the face with the pan. When he fell back, she smacked him again. The second hit knocked him over, and the third hit knocked him out cold. Jennifer panicked again, and for a moment I thought the man hadn't been knocked out yet. She reached down and picked something up off the ground. The man had broken in through our window, holding a meat cleaver in his hand. Who knows what would have happened if Jennifer hadn't acted so swiftly. So I want to get this out of the way right now. I live in Michigan and not exactly in the nicest area either. There have been multiple occasions which have been caught on video of people either trying to steal my mom's car, two generators, or break into the house entirely. It's gone far enough for someone to break into our sunroom before our family's dog scared them off. Now, how is this relevant to the story, you might ask? Well, we recently moved the camera with the motion lights on it to the front fence to watch the cars. It had previously been hooked up on the garage to get a view of the back. The reason for moving it was because we had a small driveway and could only park one car in without things being cramped. The garage itself had two motorcycles as well. One was my brother's and one my stepfather's. Because of all this concentrated value, I'd had encounters with these people trying to break in before. I even caught them in the car one time and have caught them three times in the backyard. Now we get to the actual relevance of this whole post. Two nights ago, I was taking the garbage out. It was around 10 to 10.30 p.m. I wanted to do it before I got on the game because I knew I'd forget if I didn't. I tossed everything in the bin. There was considerable space between our three garbage cans, and after I tossed them in the first one, I heard something scurrying off. Without our motion light on, I couldn't exactly tell what it was, since it was pitch black outside. I wasn't too scared, though. One of our bins had a big hole in it, and because of that, we'd get raccoons coming around all the time. I figured I'd just scared off one of those little guys. Later in the night, around 1.30 a.m., I decided to hang around with my brother for a bit. We went riding around town on the motorcycle and got back about 15 minutes later. He pulled into the driveway, and since we as of now were running off a generator which couldn't power the garage, he told me we'd need to pull the garage hood manually while he backed his work truck up. I began to open it, and he was backing up. The red lights of his truck lit up the backyard a bit. As he was backing up, I began to hear something scurrying around the side of the house again. I quickly turned on my phone flashlight, since this time I actually had it on me. My brother asked me what was wrong. Oh, nothing. It's probably just a raccoon in the trash. I turned my light on, and boom. There was this, like, I don't know how to describe it. There was a man, and he was on all fours just waiting in the darkness next to our house. That's all I could see before I screamed and started bolting the other way. Now, I have no idea what he was doing there like that, but this guy was massive. 
My brother was 200 pounds, and he was bigger than him even. Big enough that he'd broken the hinge on our fence. I didn't actually see him do this since it was down the street, but the fence had a padlock. The part that made me the most confused is that after I took off running, I went to investigate the next morning. I looked and there were no tracks or any evidence of the person around. I wanted to post this to see if anyone might have some help as to what I should do. Anyway, it's 3.49 in the morning, and remembering it has me terrified. I lived in Wisconsin and worked at a covert restaurant when I had this horrible experience. At the time, I had an old clunker for a car. It would get me to and from work, sure, but it was one of those cars that every time you drove it, you just knew something was eventually going to happen. You always just hoped that when it did, it was going to be nice outside at least. Of course, that's never how it actually works out. The day I finally had the problem with my car, it was definitely not a nice day. It had been snowing hard all day long, and the ride to work had been bad enough. This day just got worse and worse. While I was working the closing shift, I don't think the entire nine hours I was at work the snow even slowed down once. It was just constant, even though the plows had been running all day long. They could only do so much before the roads just ended up covered once they left. We closed at 10 p.m. or so, and it took us another 45 minutes to clean up the store. There was one co-worker and one manager with me. We locked up all the doors and then went our own ways. It felt quite good to get out of work finally. I knew it would feel even better to get home, but I was not looking forward to the journey there. I lived a good 10 miles away, and in these weather conditions that ride was going to take forever. I had only gotten about halfway there when the very worst thing happened. I blew a tire. I was panicked at first. I was worried I was going to wreck the car due to the lack of traction on the ice. Somehow, though, I managed to pull into the parking lot of a nearby office building. Although I did have a spare, I didn't have a jack or anything to get the lug nuts off the tire, apparently. Yeah, I know, it's stupid. But I always thought I'd have the time to get those things if I ever needed them. Now, I had no idea what I was going to do. There was no way I could just walk home, and I definitely couldn't leave my car here either. Even if I could call a taxi, if I left my car there, it might get towed away and I just could not afford a towing fee right now. I tried my best to get a hold of some friends, but nobody was answering their phone that day. I waited there in my car for a while, just watching the snow fall and wondering what I could do in this situation. I wasn't in the parking lot for more than 15 minutes when an SUV pulled off the road and drove over to me. I was immediately worried I was about to get in some trouble for idling in the parking lot but I was also hopeful this was just someone trying to help me. A big, husky, bearish-looking man climbed out of this SUV and walked up to my car. He knocked gently on the window, and I rolled it down. Hey there, need some help changing a tire? The burly man said. Yeah, I don't have any jacks or tools on me. I do have the tire, though, I explained to him. The man, as nice as could be, told me he had some tools and would be more than willing to help me change my tire. I'm not a particularly big guy myself, and I'd never had to do it before. This guy seemed thankfully genuinely willing to help me out. He went over to his SUV and got his tools. I thanked him profusely. As he began to change the tire, I got out of the car and stood behind him. I told him from now on I would get the tools and if this ever happened again, I would be prepared from then on. While the man was explaining to me what to do though, I caught something in the very corner of my eye. I didn't know what it was at first, but looking back towards that SUV, I saw the scariest thing I'd ever seen in my life. There was a person, bloodied up with duct tape over her mouth, trying to climb into the front of the car. Her hands were duct taped together as well, and her eyes were desperate for help. I was immediately scared to death. I didn't know what to do. It wasn't like I could fight this guy. He would tear me apart without even trying. 
I figured the only thing I could do was not let on that I just noticed her and memorize his license plate number, call the police when he left. The rest of the tire change was just terrifying. I had no idea what that man was going to do with me. I didn't know if he was just trying to be helpful or if he wanted to hurt me too. I tried my best not to look nervous, but every time he moved closer, I nearly jumped out of my skin. When he had finally changed the tire and began to lower the car back down, I reached into my pocket and grabbed my car keys. He picked up the jack and asked me to lean over and take a look. I really didn't want to do so, but I did it very slowly while making sure to keep an eye on him. When he saw how slowly I was moving, he picked up his tools and went over to put them in the back of his car. Immediately, I grabbed my keys out of my pocket, threw my door open, and slammed it shut. I looked in the mirror and saw the man had noticed me. He began to move quickly around the SUV. I turned on my own car. Thank God the horror movie cliches don't happen in real life. My car started right away. I put it in gear and took off before the man could get to the side of my car. I pulled away, slipping more than once on the ice and almost sending my car spinning. Eventually, I did get away, and it was long before he had a chance to get into his SUV and follow me. I drove straight to the police station to tell them what I'd witnessed. While I was giving my statement, they sent the cars out to the parking lot. They found the girl, still duct taped and nearly naked, lying frozen and covered in snow in the parking lot. A man must have figured he'd gotten caught and dumped her. He probably hadn't figured I'd had the time to memorize his plate numbers. I'm very happy to report the police found him as well. I testified at his trial, and he went to prison. The woman turned out to actually be his girlfriend. She was very convinced he wanted to kill her, and very thankful to me that my tire had gone out that night, and I'd called the police to come help. Now this is something I really want to talk about to be sure that everyone is cautious and stays level-headed at all times. For some context, I live in the middle of nowhere in Canada, an old town that had quite a few abandoned buildings due to an absence of residents. Me and my many friends were tired of the lack of entertainment options for us, so what we decided to do was explore these abandoned buildings. Prior to the experience I'm about to talk about, nothing had ever happened that was crazy to us. Occasionally, we'd see a small bit of blood-like liquid or other bodily fluids or see a pentagram spray-painted on the ground from someone who went to a house previously, but nothing too crazy. Until the last time I went to explore. When I was younger, I used to go to a daycare that was part mental hospital. Weird combination, I know. It closed down due to a lack of patience and a lack of children at the daycare. Big surprise, I guess. I decided to go back there with my friends to explore. For context, I was 15 when this happened, and most of my friends were the same age. When we got there, it was rather cliche. There was fog, and it was rather dark. There was also a light drizzle of rain. We went to the main gate, which had been padlocked shut. We decided to help each other hop over it and made a ton of noise in the process. We were all laughing and giggling the whole time, unsuspecting of what was to come. We looked around at the small play place and park with flashlights we had on our person. Even with our somewhat powerful lights, the visibility was rather limited. We decided to actually enter the building itself. Glass and dirt crunched under our feet as we stepped into the daycare section of the complex. There were still old Legos and wood chips from previous furniture, old torn dolls and toys strewn about. The further we walked around the daycare section, we naturally became more and more silent, until all we could hear was the crunch of the dirt under our feet. I found some crayons in a plastic container in the corner of the room. I walked over to observe them, when all of a sudden, we heard a loud crash coming from behind a metal door leading to the psych ward part of the building. My friends and I nervously glanced at each other. As a whole, we were a group of five. Most of us were very bold and cocky. As we shared our glances, my friend Brian suggested we go and check to see what the sound had come from. Personally, I was not too fond of the idea, but with my group of friends, there was no way anyone was going to decline such a thing. 
We all stacked up against the door and opened it slowly. It was rusted to the floor, and we had to heave hard to get it to open. As we walked in, the metallic smell and must became stronger, with a hint of something else which I couldn't quite put my finger on at the moment. We walked in, our flashlights pointed in every direction, with Brian leading the group. The hallways were tight. To the left and right were the occasional metal doorway, some with the doors wide open. I felt slightly claustrophobic, and it felt a little bit hard to breathe. As we continued, Brian shone his flashlight into a room and recoiled. We all stopped walking as Brian slowly entered the room. What's wrong? I asked him. Oh, I thought I saw someone here, but it seems it's all fine now. To be honest, I thought he was just messing with us to increase our anxiety. But looking back, I think he was completely honest. He backed out of the room to join us again, and we continued walking deeper into the psych ward. That is, until another friend suddenly told us to stop. We came to a halt and began to listen. In the distance ahead of us in the darkness, we could hear the subtle pitter-patter of footsteps echoing down the hallway. We each looked at each other, fear in our eyes. Brian continued walking toward the sounds. We considered turning back for a moment without him, wondering if some ghost or something was in the building. But of course, we wouldn't do that to him. The closer we got to the sounds, the more I felt like I was being watched. When we finally entered a room on the right, there was a smell of rotting meat. In front of us was a dead deer. Its innards were spilled all over the floor, staining the concrete. A friend of mine had a very weak stomach and vomited all over the floor. At that moment, we began to hear whispering. Brian shone his flashlight to the corner of the room, where a man with short hair was standing with his head facing down. He wore a bright green t-shirt, stained with what I assume was blood. He didn't have any socks on, and his feet appeared quite badly damaged. He was twitching sporadically, and continued to mumble even after we saw him. We stared at him for a solid 30 seconds, before he made his first true movement. The man looked up at us with vacant eyes and a haunting grin that sent shivers down my spine. Are you guys here for the feast? He said each word with a varying inflection and energy. This kicked us over the edge, and we bolted out of the room all the way back to the daycare center. The door was still open. We decided to try and slam it shut, but the rust and weight of the door kept it open. It took three of us pulling with all our strength to close it behind us. Just before we did, we could see the silhouette of the man in the darkness watching us, his white teeth being the only feature we could see. We sat behind the metal door, catching our breath for a moment, all looking at each other for confirmation we really just saw that. After a little bit of labored breathing from each of us, we heard a light tapping on the other side of the door. That's when we decided it was time to leave. We booked it out of the complex and ran home. A year after we visited that spot, police were doing a routine search of the area and stumbled upon the man. It was stated that this guy used to go to the psych ward before it closed down. He had been transferred to another place, and when let out, he went back and lived off the wildlife around the complex for a while. When the cops brought him in, he had a series of diseases and sicknesses from eating raw meat, and his mental condition was much worse than before. There were of course rumors that he'd killed someone in the forest while searching for food and eaten them, but nothing like that had ever been confirmed. I guess the guy couldn't let go of his old habits. Have you ever driven through one of those really rural areas and seen those old gray, abandoned, and weather-torn buildings just sitting off the road? Some of them are set in the strangest places, and you wonder why anyone would ever have built a building there. I enjoy exploring those sorts of places due to the way it allows my imagination to think about what the building's history was. You sometimes find these sorts of places out in the middle of forests or fields. In those cases, I tend to assume that they were there first, and the forest eventually grew up around the buildings once they'd been abandoned. A few years back, I was exploring out in the woods, trying to find some new cool places. I was going pretty deep now, possibly trespassing on someone else's property, but I didn't really care much about that. 
Late in the afternoon, around the time when I should have begun to head back, I came across a particularly dilapidated two-story building. The building itself was heavily rotting, and it was covered with moss. It even had a tree growing right through the center. I had no idea how long this building could have possibly been here. I had to be extremely careful entering. As far as I knew, anything that looked worn down might have weak floors and might collapse at any moment. Walking up the steps, I definitely heard some loud creaks, but despite my initial worries, the steps held up rather well. It was when I entered through the door that I finally realized what this building must have been. There was a very small foyer that led into the main room, which took up the majority of the bottom floor. I was surprised to discover that this appeared to be a one-room schoolhouse. There were old desks lined up in straight rows, and even a chalkboard on the wall farthest from me. I had never seen a one-room school in person before, so I was very intrigued. I walked through and past the desks, to where I saw another door. It must lead to a back room, I assumed, since it wasn't set far enough back to be a back door to the building itself. I opened the door and noticed it seemed to be some sort of office or something. That wasn't what caught my attention, though. The floor was absolutely covered in animal bones, and I don't mean just a little bit. There were piles of bones up to my ankles all over the floor. The bones were strung together with string, and some hung from the walls and ceiling. I was freaked out and decided to head back to the main room. As I started to move, though, something else caught my attention urgently. The floor had been creaking as I was walking along, but when I stopped, I realized I could hear something else creaking above my head. It was a two-story building, and it was apparent that something was on the top floor. I tried to convince myself it was just an animal, but still I felt rather uncomfortable. I thought it might be a good idea to just get the hell out of there. I took my camera out to snap a few pictures before leaving. When I decided to try and get a shot of the lighting fixtures on the ceiling, I turned the camera up, and that's when I saw it. Half of a human face, looking down through a little hole in the ceiling. The eyes watching me blinked. I nearly pissed myself and dropped my camera. The face disappeared back into the darkness upstairs. I began to hear rapid creaking sounds as the person upstairs began to randomly walk around. Then I heard them start sprinting toward the staircase. I'd had enough. I found my camera and grabbed it. I decided to get the hell out of there. I ran out and I didn't look back at all. I ran out of the building and kept going until I was sure that person was not following me. It's weird in a way because I had no way of knowing what the person in that building was or if they were dangerous in any way, but for some reason, hearing them come down the stairs like that was the most frightening experience of my entire life. I didn't even want to see the person themselves. I mean, sure, I was out in the middle of nowhere, searching through an abandoned building. That person was there before me on the exact same day, so I decided it best to just leave them to whatever they were doing. When I was around 10 or so, my parents and I went to visit my grandmother for spring break. My cousin also came to visit as well, and we decided we wanted to go to the YMCA for the day. My grandmother dropped us off and said she would come and pick us up in four hours. On that day, the YMCA was empty. There were a couple of adults in the exercise room, but that's about it. We went to the basketball court, and after two hours of playing tag and shooting baskets, we were quite bored. I've never been the biggest fan of swimming, but this YMCA had a pretty cool pool area. We changed into our bathing suits and headed in there. The pool was completely empty, all except for the lifeguard. We played a bunch of games and swam some laps, but after an hour, there wasn't much left to do yet again. There was no one except us to hang out with to keep things interesting either. We decided to play a bit of a game, seeing how long we could hold our breath underwater. We stood in the shallow end near the clock on the wall so we could time ourselves. Instead of fully submerging, we'd just stick our heads face down in the water a bit. We did this a couple of times and I ended up winning. On our very last round, I felt a tap on my shoulder. 
I figured it was my cousin giving up and telling me I'd won. Instead, it was the lifeguard who told me to knock it off or she was going to have to ask us to leave the pool. Since we were tired of being in there anyway, we figured we'd just get out. We'd get dressed, go back to the basketball court until our grandmother picked us up and just wait there. We only had an hour left anyways, and the water was freezing by this point. As we got out, the lifeguard stopped us and asked us if we wanted to go into the sauna to warm up and dry off. The sign said 18 years or older, so of course we were super excited she allowed us to even do that. She walked us to the sauna and unlocked the door. The door was glass, and the interior was made entirely out of wood. Inside above the door, there was a clock, probably to make sure you were not in there for an unsafe amount of time. The lifeguard stand was adjacent to the sauna, but if you looked out the door you could very clearly see it. She followed us in, went over to the thermometer encased in plastic, and unlocked it so she could crank up the heat. I figured she must have to turn it on each time or something, so I didn't really think much of it. Both my cousin and I were very short girls, so we couldn't actually see the temperature that was printed on the thermometer knob. We knew she was turning up the heat at least. She left and shut the door behind her. I thought I saw her lock the door as well. I thought to myself though, why would she lock the door when we might want to get out? I checked the clock and decided we should leave in about 10 minutes or so. It was already plenty warm in the sauna, but the room only began to get more blazing. It felt nice at first because I was so cold from the pool. After about 15 minutes though, it was starting to get a bit too hot. My cousin agreed we should leave so we could get dressed. I went to turn the knob on the door, only to find that it would not budge at all. I thought maybe it had been jammed, so I shook it as hard as I could. It still wouldn't open. I then let my cousin try. She couldn't get it to open either. We figured the lifeguard would be back in a couple of minutes anyway, so we sat back down and waited. The room was getting hotter and hotter, and I really wanted to leave. We got up and started banging on the door for help, shaking and twisting the knob trying to get the guard's attention. As the room continued to get hotter, we began to scream at the top of our lungs for her to let us out, but she just stared straight ahead ignoring us. There's no way she wouldn't have noticed or heard us banging and kicking the door and screaming. By now, we had been in there for 25 minutes. It was so hot in the sauna I could barely even breathe. It felt like my lungs were on fire. My skin and eyes were burning. We sat back down and put our towels over our heads. They were at least still a little bit damp and made it easier to breathe. I was worried about my cousin especially. She was a couple of years younger than me and she was really struggling. I looked at the clock and saw we had been stuck inside for 35 minutes. I got up and walked to the door again. I saw the guard still just staring straight ahead. Again, I tried to get her attention by screaming we needed out right now. I banged on the door as hard as I could, but still nothing. I was starting to get dizzy. I went to sit back down, but the wooden seats were so hot that they burned my skin. The towel was completely dry, so I put it underneath me to cover my skin. My hair was also extremely dry. I wrapped it across my face to cover my nose and squinted my eyes so they wouldn't burn as badly. I tried my best to still watch if anyone walked past the door. It helped me a bit. My cousin was laying down with the towel over her head, not moving or saying anything anymore. I nudged her to make sure she was still okay. I could tell we really needed to get out of here right now. She was extremely disoriented. It had been 45 minutes now and I was beginning to get nauseous. There was no way the lifeguard had simply forgotten we were in there. I thought she would come back soon, but there was a little voice in my head telling me that she'd purposefully locked us in there. Finally, a man just happened to be walking past the door to the pool. I was too weak to even get up though. My whole body was on fire. I was too dizzy to stand. Luckily, the man wasn't going to the pool. He wanted to be let into the sauna and came back with the lifeguard. I saw them walking this way and immediately jumped up to grab my cousin. I knew now for sure she had locked us in there because as she neared the door, she pulled out her keys to unlock it and let the man in. I didn't want to take any chances of us being trapped in there any longer. As the man was trying to walk in, I was desperately trying to shove our way out. As we were trying to escape, the lifeguard began to shut the door and try to push me back inside. The man was clearly confused about what was going on. 
Hey, what are you doing? I think they want to get out. The lifeguard let out a huge sigh and opened the door fully. I grabbed my cousin and ran as fast as I could to the changing room. We only had about ten minutes before grandmother was supposed to pick us up. We were both so shaken by what just happened that we didn't say anything to each other as we got dressed or on the car ride home. When we got back to the house, my parents were making us dinner and I told them the story of what happened. They thought I must have been exaggerating and told me they didn't believe me. I truly believed that woman was going to let us cook alive in there. The only bit of doubt I have is what would have happened if we'd actually died. She obviously would have gotten the blame. So what was her endgame? I'm 21 now, but I still think about this interaction all the time. When I'm in small spaces or I get too warm, I still have panic attacks. No one I tell ever believes this story. I mean, I get it, it's pretty absurd, I know. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask for opinions or whatnot, but what do you think this could have been? Some crazy misunderstanding? Or do you think she really wanted us to die? If so, why? When I was younger and just got into online college, I got my first apartment. I had three jobs and one was third shift. I was more than ready for independence. While I had a great time there, I did have one problem. My new downstairs neighbor. So, the other tenants were a bit older than I am, with one of them even being an old man who'd lived there for 20 years. The other was a middle-aged woman with a small kid, probably been there for three or four years. Then there was an empty apartment downstairs. I kept to myself and never really spoke to any of them, before I noticed that there had been a new move-in, a man that seemed closer to my age, perhaps a tiny bit older. He had black greasy hair and was a little bit overweight, but my experience living here with people seemed very nice. I was happy to have another neighbor to say hello to. That possibility turned sour quite quickly. I said a casual hello, which turned into that trash stinks remarks from him when I was taking out the trash, and snide remarks under his breath when I'd done nothing wrong. He even remarked on my sister's lack of a bra when she came to visit me. Naturally, I was annoyed that he had to comment on anyone and everything, especially on my sister. I told the landlord about him, but nothing came of it, of course. One day when I was asleep, someone came banging on my door. I had no idea who it could be. I was alone, and I never expected a knock that wasn't planned. It was that annoying neighbor saying I was being too loud and I needed to stop harassing him. I explained through the door that I was asleep and was not making any noise at all. He stomped down the stairs, all while screaming that I was a dumb bitch. My heart felt like it was beating out of my chest. I went back to bed, only to hear him stomp back up the stairs and start slamming on my door. When I asked him what was wrong with him, he kept saying I was harassing him. He was calling the cops because I was making too much noise. There was no way I could possibly be making any noise loud enough for him to hear. He was on the other side of the building. He stormed off, cursing and calling me a bitch yet again. I told the landlord that he was now becoming hostile, then I didn't feel comfortable with him around. He told me he would look into it, and I didn't hear anything again for a week. It turned out it was his neighbor hitting the floor with a stick because the rude neighbor next to them was playing their music too loud or something. He should have known that, as I was on the complete other side, but it was like he just wanted an excuse to come bother me. The following months it got even worse. One day, I walked out in a snowsuit so I could play around in the snow. He made fun of me about how unnecessary it was. There was three feet of snow out. I forgot what I said in response. Something like it was not any of his business. He said fuck you and told me he was going to kill me. I walked off to go play in the snow. At least that gave me a bit of enjoyment after our earlier interaction. I went back home to get ready for work. The snow got even worse and I had just come back from my night shift. I saw him sitting alone in the parking lot, with his car on and all the windows up. I was on high alert. I walked around and up the alley to my apartment. The second I closed the door to the upstairs, I heard loud wall-shaking music begin blasting. Of course, he was doing this at 3am. 
I was surprised and confused what his reasoning could possibly be, especially since he'd been bothering me about harassing him before. He blasted this until 8 o'clock in the morning. Soon it started getting more serious, confronting me in the hallway, constantly blasting huge loud music at me. The police knocking at our doors asking us about the noise disturbances. There was now a mutual hatred amongst all the other neighbors at this asshole who kept acting up. Another time, I'd just gotten back from my night shift and it was 3 a.m. yet again. I was dragging my tired feet over to the mailboxes that were right inside the townhouse door. As I'm searching through my ads and letters, his door opens at the top of the stairs. My stomach tightened, hoping I wouldn't have to interact with him. I began to feel very unsettled when he started speaking to me, but all his words were coming out unintelligibly. He began gurgling and mumbling something to himself. He kept repeating these weird sounds and appeared to be getting more aggressive. I felt something was really wrong here. I started to swiftly walk around and out the door heading back to my car. I thought I'd rather sleep in my car than be attacked in the hallway in front of my apartment. Just as I was having the thought, I heard the window above slam open. I froze and stopped just before the edge of the corner so I was still out of sight. He was staring out his window, seemingly searching all over for me. I stood there for a moment, watching him. He was yelling insane gibberish. I thought to myself it was my chance to sneak upstairs. If he was looking out the window, he wouldn't see me pass by his door and into my place. I sped up the stairs and passed his door to the second flight. Right as I reached the top, his door swung open with a big slam. I heard that he'd begun to follow behind me. My heart was beating out of my ribcage. I was walking, fishing my keys out of my bag. Like a classic horror movie, I kept fumbling looking for the correct one. The hallway was completely dark, and I could hear him right behind me. Mentally, I told myself not to panic. I spotted the correct key and slid it into the keyhole on the first go. I swung the door open and launched myself inside before slamming it shut behind me. I paused and held my breath. I could hear him standing against my door, muttering gibberish into it and calling me all sorts of names. I heard him stumble back downstairs and out the building. I watched him through a crack in my window blind, pacing back and forth, muttering, cursing, and at one point screaming before walking off into the night. A little bit of relief as I headed to bed, hoping he wouldn't come back to bother me. The next day, I got a text from the landlord. He said the guy was arrested and wouldn't be coming back. Seems he was off his meds again or something. Of course, I raised an eyebrow to that comment. Now, you tell me? I followed a link my landlord had sent me, which showed a mugshot and a description of his nightly activity, including stealing, threatening cops to shoot them, and even punching one of them. I never did see him again, just his family coming in and moving his stuff out. But that was a pretty scary time for me. When I was little, I lived in a very safe neighborhood. All the neighbors were either friends or relatives of friends, and this being the late 80s, we were allowed to roam and play however much we wanted, as long as we'd be back home before dinner. The earliest encounter I can remember with this creep was when I was around six years old or so. I was with a group of other kids, riding our bikes down the steep hill that led down into our neighborhood. One of the other kids suddenly noticed a man standing against a fence at the top of the hill, not very far away from this parked blue van. I didn't recognize the man, and neither did anyone else around me, but that didn't really mean anything at the time. I had only just been allowed to leave the yard, and assumed I didn't know everyone in the area yet. I don't know why, but we all decided to go over to him. My parents had told me to stay with the group, so I just followed along behind. I don't really remember much about the man, only that he seemed to pay an extraordinary amount of attention to me. Even after the other kids had wandered off to continue riding on their bikes, the man kept me staying and talking. I remember very clearly how when he asked my age and I told him, he smiled this big creepy smile and said I looked much older at least 12 or 13. 
I guess this was supposed to be a compliment, but I was aware of how much younger I looked and was compared to everyone else. I mean, I didn't even have a bike because I was too small to reach the pedals on my own. I even had pigtails with ribbons in them. I don't know if he creeped me out exactly, but I quickly excused myself and rejoined the group. Honestly, I think I felt more insulted than anything, like he was making fun of me by pointing out I didn't really belong with this group of teenagers. Eventually, I went home though, and I didn't tell my parents about the man. In my mind, he was an adult and I wasn't allowed to question adults at that age. Stranger danger had never really been much of a thing in my family. Skip ahead three years now. It was Christmas and I was nine years old. I'd finally been given my very own bike. And this one was not a little kid's bike either. I was so proud I just had to go out to try it, despite the cold weather. Of course, my parents allowed it right away. I headed out to that hill all alone. It was Christmas and no one was going to come play on Christmas morning. I had spent about 20 minutes rocketing down the hill on my cherry red bicycle. I even wiped out once, skinning my palms. When I started to notice a blue van driving by slowly and repeatedly as well, I didn't remember that previous encounter at this point. I suppose like for any six-year-old, something that happened three years ago was completely inconsequential at the time, and I'd quickly forgotten about it. This van drove down the road, past the drive into the neighborhood, at least three times. I got this very strange feeling, a tingling down my spine, like someone was watching me. I'd never had that feeling before in my life. The only way I can describe it is a visceral, primitive warning that you're now the prey to someone very dangerous. Luckily, I was able to keep my cool though. I kept on riding my bike and watched that same van drive slowly by back and forth at least a dozen times. Finally, when it passed me by for the last time and disappeared behind some trees, I took the opportunity to book it down the hill using gravity and every bit of strength in my legs to build up enough speed to get me all the way to the end of the drive. I did it so fast I didn't even have to stop. Quite a feat since my house was the very last one. I ditched my brand new bike in the grass and ran inside to safety. Again, I didn't tell my parents though. Half because I felt like I was just being silly, and half because my mom was cooking and my dad was watching TV. Two activities to never be interrupted in my house, on threat of spanking. I never saw that blue van again. I didn't find out until I was 29 exactly how lucky I was that day. After my father's death, I helped my mother clear out his house. While looking through some old boxes, I found an old answering machine, a bunch of tapes and a tape player as well. Knowing the narcissist my father was, I assume they must be a combination of old messages from nearly three decades ago, and him singing badly and playing the guitar even worse. I took the whole thing home and started to listen to the tapes, mostly for nostalgia. I was half right, but they were not just missed calls from friends and family. I was not in any way prepared for the absolute filth on these old answering machine tapes. I'm not one to blush at bad language. Though I may not use some of the words I heard myself, it didn't really bother me when others did. But this, this made me physically sick. Maybe because these messages were all directed at me. At a child version of me. Entire hours-long tapes were filled with this one single man calling over and over. They started with some polite-sounding variation of, This message is for my name. If you could let her know, I'd really appreciate it. Afterwards, nothing but graphic, vulgar descriptions of what he planned to do to me step by step. How he wouldn't hurt me too much. He'd make sure to leave me somewhere my parents could find me when he was done. He didn't say whether he meant alive or not either. He called me his girlfriend and talked about how beautiful I was. There were long tributes to my blonde hair and how he planned to cut it off and keep it after he'd defiled me. He'd wash it off first, of course. He wasn't dirty like that. This was, of course, all in the most filthy language you wouldn't even find in porn. 
The messages stopped abruptly right around when I was 10 years old, though. After that, it was nothing but the usual missed calls again. I don't know what happened to that man. He really didn't sound like the kind of person to just go and give up. Maybe he ended up dead or in jail, but I do know my dad had a tendency of handling things himself. I know of at least two other incidents when someone was bothering my mom or me. They stopped after he went to have a talk with them. Looking back, I suspect that my father was a genuine psychopath in a clinical sense. I destroyed those tapes because I didn't want my mother to find them. If she knew, I have no plans to bring it up now. If she didn't, I don't want her to ever know, for her own peace of mind. Honestly, I kind of wish I hadn't found it either. I recently received a friend request that reminded me of this story. This happened after I went to university, so I was about 18 years old at the time. I had made an effort to make friends after I moved onto campus and ended up with a few groups to hang out with, including a new girlfriend and plenty of people from my classes that I liked well enough. There was one class before lunch where it was traditional for people to go to the cafeteria afterwards to eat in pairs or threes. I wasn't very discerning about who I'd go with because I got along fine with most people from the class. We were all sort of trying to make an effort to be social at that age. This meant that when one particular girl, Lily, asked if I wanted to go eat lunch together after that class, I didn't have any reason to refuse. We talked about school and mostly pretty casual stuff. Nothing really noteworthy. She did ask me to get lunch with her again the next week, though. Soon it became a pattern and there wasn't exactly a way to start saying no suddenly. It was fine with me, but it did mean I lost the chance to eat lunch with anyone else on those days, which sort of hindered my social life a little. In hindsight, I suppose that was the point, though. One day in class, I asked someone if I could add them on social media, and this just happened to occur in front of Lily. Immediately, I saw her face jerk towards me from a couple seats over. It was such a sharp reaction that it was hard to ignore. I still remember it even to this day. Needless to say, by the time I'd gotten home later, Lily had already sent me a friend request. We had no friends in common either. I don't even know how she knew my last name. I was a bit surprised, but I guess maybe she dug through the university's social media pages and found me through there or something. I did get a bad feeling, but surely this was fine. She ended up messaging me quite a lot and commenting on anything I posted. I told myself she was just awkward. We became friends, if not close, and I'd known worse people. She still always got me to go eat lunch with her after our shared class. Other than that, though, we very rarely had any time together in person. I would see her around sometimes, but I never went out of my way to hang out with her, you know? This meant it was mostly online messaging and seeing each other in group settings. Coincidentally, my girlfriend was also called Lily. This was something that clearly bothered the other Lily. She occasionally hinted that she wanted my girlfriend to pick a different name or joked about it not suiting her. Clearly, she did not like my girlfriend at all, and I had an idea as to why. It was getting hard to ignore by this point. Lily was starting to unsubtly hint that she had a crush on me. I tried my best not to address it. I mean, what was I going to say? I'd never known what to do when a friend tried to make a pass at me. I was also not interested in the very least. Even ignoring some of the weird stuff she did, Lily was just not my type. She tended to act and dress in a way somewhere between a 50s housewife and all those adults still obsessed with Disney princesses if you can picture that combination. Things took an uncomfortable turn on the day of our last shared class of the year. Instead of asking me to lunch like she usually did, she asked if I'd go out for a walk with her. Again, I didn't know how to refuse, so I said a small one would be fine. Our campus was bordered by a large patch of woodland. Lily led me out into the woods, and the sounds of our fellow students slowly faded away. She sat down on a log and I joined her. 
She started talking about how much she was going to miss me over the summer. I tried placating her, but I really didn't want to be there, especially because she seemed to be on the verge of tears. I tried to make an excuse about having plans with my girlfriend, but before I could say anything, Lily chose to lean in and kiss me without warning. It was uncomfortable, to say the least. I got out of there and was happy to think I would not see her for a while. I came back to university after summer, moving into a house with my friends. Without going off topic, there were some serious issues in that group. Lots of petty arguing and even worse. I broke up with my girlfriend around the start of that school year as well. Basically, the whole mess made me recontextualize things with Lily. It didn't seem quite so bad after all that drama. That said, I still didn't want to be alone with her. We mostly just talked online. She was still constantly messaging me every day, after all. One upside of everything was that I started dating a boy. Lily was not pleased to hear that news. I think she hoped to kind of sneak in after I broke up with my girlfriend, but as I said before, that was never going to happen. This is where the story gets bad. At this time, I was fairly active on Tumblr. I occasionally talked about my life and mostly just reblogged photos and things I found interesting. I was on there one day when something odd happened. One of the blogs I followed had received an ask with some phrases I recognized. It took a second to register that it was taken from my about page. That made me freeze. I read the message properly. Someone was asking this completely random person to analyze a section of text from my page asking for their opinion on the type of person who would write it. I cannot stress how messed up it was to see people talking about me like I was a character in a book or something. The important thing, though, was that the question had not been anonymous. It linked to someone's blog. Obviously, I wanted to know who had taken such a bizarre interest in me in particular. As far as I knew, not a single person in real life knew about my page. It's not like I shared it around or anything. No prizes for guessing who was behind it. What I found was disturbing. It was almost like a shrine. She was using a fake name, but I recognized Lily all over that thing. It was this cutesy pink and red page. There were a few posts about her interest, but most of the content was focused on her primary interest. Me. Most of the posts were all about me. There were accounts of things I'd done recently places I'd been, groups I participated in, going to the nightclub recently, as well as references to things as far back as I'd known her. It was clear she'd been keeping tabs on me, both online and offline, gathering every scrap of information she could about my life and hoarding it in this little collection. She talked about us eating lunch together, how special our dates had been to her, as if it was anything more than acquaintances just getting food after class. She even talked about the time she had forcibly kissed me in the woods. She quoted lyrics from all of my favorite songs, even though I'd never talked about them, and talked about how she'd always be there for me, no matter who else came into my life. Lots of references to loving me just the way he is as well, which answered another mystery about some anonymous love letters I'd been receiving earlier that year with the same wording. It got worse. There were a lot of posts about my boyfriend as well. Those were not so nice. It was angry and hateful. I didn't like to think of the sort of person who could write so obsessively being fixated on me. One thing that didn't make sense at first was that the blog had also made plenty of references to this best friend, Steven. She had never mentioned this person to me, and I'd never seen anyone else around her either. Her post talked a lot about Steven, and how great a friend he was, how much fun they had together, how much he looked out for her. I was trying to work out whether this was an online friend or something, when one specific post made it all click. She had posted a photo and captioned it, Steven sent this to me, he knew I would like it. The problem was, it was a photo taken straight from my page. I had not sent that to her. She took it from my page and then claimed I was her fictional best friend, because in her head she'd split me into two people, the two most important people in her life. In her messed up fantasies, I was both her perfect best friend 
and her soulmate who was going to end up with her. Who was she complaining to? Oh, she had an audience all right. People who took what she said at face value. I saw a bunch of random people agreeing with this stalker, things like, my boyfriend didn't deserve me, we were bound to break up soon, I would be with Lily, the person I was clearly destined to be with. She had this fake fanfiction version of my life up for anyone to share their opinion on, and she made herself out to be the hero of it all, of course. I had only gone maybe a month back into this page's history, and I didn't look at everything that was there. It was too much, and I didn't want to see if there was anything from before I'd known her. Needless to say, I sent Lily a message confronting her about this blog. She said nothing. I can't stress how weird it was to have found pages and pages dedicated to me. Then she just acted like it never happened. She said nothing. Didn't even address it, just changed the subject like I'd never even said it, like she hadn't even registered that it existed. I've never seen deflection quite like it. Well, of course, afterwards she deleted the page, or at least changed the name and hid it because I could never find it again. That was not the end, though. I was not going to hang out with her anymore, but we were still shoved together in classes. She had started to actually scare me with what she might do next. I'm kind of a paranoid person already, so knowing someone was obsessively keeping track of me for who knows how long really scared me a lot. The next thing she pulled was trying to seduce my boyfriend. That was a useless attempt. What was her plan there? Did she hope to tell me he cheated and wait for me to break up with him or something? Why would I want her after that? When that didn't work, she tried to seduce all of my friends. None of them took the bait, thankfully. She ended up dating one of my former housemates for a while, but made sure to send me messages every day while they were together, letting me know she'd rather be with me instead. Lily made sure to stay in my life the entire time I was at university. There was a time when I tried to pull away from her, and she ended up starting these malicious rumors about me and damaging a career opportunity I'd put a lot of time into. I don't know all of what she did behind my back, but it made me realize it might be safer to just let her think she was a part of my life while ignoring her, rather than do something that would cause her to get angry. I knew at this point she really didn't have any reservations about hurting me to get what she wanted. After I graduated, Lily of course still wanted to hang around me, but now I didn't have that additional impetus of school keeping me there. I made excuses about work and barely talked to her after that point. I had entirely stopped posting on social media I knew she knew about. Of course, she would not give up that easily. Usually, I ignored all of her attempts though. I didn't think she was still tracking me online, but in hindsight, she probably was. I don't know how, but she'd reference things I mentioned online somewhere else. Somewhere else she couldn't have known about. The last time we had a conversation for real, she sent me a message out of nowhere. We hadn't spoken at all in months, and we hadn't talked about anything serious in much longer than that. Thinking about that conversation still makes my skin crawl. At first, she asked me some questions about how long I'd known I was queer. I told her some basic stuff, the kind of things I'd tell anyone who asked. Then, she changed the subject. She started talking about how I would feel about her if she was a boy, about wanting to be a boy for me. The messages quickly became fetishistic. Again, we were not even friends at this point. We'd never been especially close, and we'd barely spoken for years. I can't imagine sending messages like that even to a close friend, let alone someone who barely knew you. I tried telling her not to pull this crap with me, and then she decided to change tactics. She started role-playing as me. The worst part is that she seemed to believe it was real, that those things had actually happened to her, even when she was quoting me word for word. Things I'd told her only hours before were now part of her life. It was like she was trying to absorb me or something, to take over my history, to make my life a part of her. Yeah, I really didn't want to talk to her again after that. I ignored future attempts she made and eventually silently deleted her from the inactive social media, which was her only real way of contacting me. I really thought she might finally move on. But then I started getting more friend requests on everywhere. They're still sitting there unanswered, because I know if I delete them, she'll somehow find a way to seek me out elsewhere. 
Lily and I met nearly 12 years ago. This story is just the highlights, and even then, it's only the stuff I knew about for sure. A lot happened behind my back. I just know it did. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now guys, so thank you so much for watching and I hope you guys have a great day.